The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tech Gig webinar series. Our endeavor is to empower techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key to enhance our skills and grow us as professionals. With this principle in mind, we have initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give you all a crisp insight into various domains. So uh, the topic for today's session is Emerging Trends in Safety Critical Software. Our guest speakers for today are David Ranson, Managing Director, Moog India, Nagaraj Narayan Murthy, Associate Director and Head Software, and Yoganand Jeppu, Head R&D Systems from Moog India. Dave Ranson has guided the development of Moog India Technology Center since 2009. Under his direction, MITC has established an aerospace qualification test laboratory, achieved AS9100 certification as a design center, and proven itself as a center of innovation for key technologies that support aerospace, automotive, and industrial controls. Dave and his leadership team have also implemented a talent management system that identifies high potential employees, prepares them for significant responsibilities within the organization, maintains a robust succession pool, and results in attrition consistently below local industry norms. With over 30 years of aerospace experience, Dave has led research, innovation, and new product development for three companies across the US, the UK, Brazil, and India. Dave has worked extensively in India since 2007. He moved to Bangalore in January 2010 and has been living there since then. Nagarajan Murthy previously was Director, Business Domain Lead at Honeywell Technology Solutions Private Limited from October 2004 to March 2009, Head and Deputy Director, Aerospace Electronics and Systems Division, NAL and Associate Project Director, SARS Program, Research Scientist at NAL, Bangalore from July 1976 to December 2001, and CSIR Junior Research Fellow at NAL from November 1974 to June 1976. Our third speaker is Yogananda Jeppu, who is a BE in Electronics and Communication from Mangalore University and a postgraduate in Missile Guidance and Controls from Pune University. He is pursuing his PhD at IIT Bombay in the field of Software Reliability. He is a recipient of many awards, notable among them being commendation certification for significant contributions made to the Integrated Guided Missiles Program and the National Aerospace Laboratories Technology Shield for Outstanding Achievement in LCA Control Law Design, Certification and Successful Flight Tests. He has a mention in the Limca Book of Records for his hobby, Philately. He is currently working with Moog India Technology Center, Bangalore as a Senior System Specialist. Before Moog, he was with Honeywell Technology Solutions where he was involved in the system testing of India SARAS Autopilot. Before Honeywell he was with ADA Bangalore as a Scientist F and before that in DRDL Hyderabad as Scientist C working on Akash Missile System. So without further delay I introduce you all to our guest speaker. Over to you David. Thanks so much. We're glad you could join us this afternoon. Today we'll be talking about emerging trends in safety critical software, something that's a big part of what we do here at Moog. We'll be talking about safety critical systems that are in many domains, both aircraft and medical systems, as well as railway, signaling, even nuclear control and automobile electronics units, all have safety critical systems. They're all around us. We interact with them every day. We all take them for granted, but a malfunction in any of these systems can be very costly, or even worse, can lead to loss of lives. Over the uh, development of software over the last four or five decades, we've seen several unfortunate, tragic instances when safety critical systems have not performed as needed. The Ariane 5 Flight 501 was aborted prematurely due to an error in floating point number to 16-bit conversion. The Terac 25 CAT scanner involved at least six accidents in 1985 to 1987 where patients received 100 times the intended dose. And then, of course, more recently in 2009, Turkish Airlines Flight 1951 crashed, resulting in the death of nine passengers and crew, including all three pilots. Moog India Technology Center is at the forefront of safety-critical systems technology. We use model-based techniques, 
automated tools and proven engineers to certify aircraft control systems. We recently played a role in the critical uh, safety critical program of several aircraft uh, certifying to DO 178B for level A critical software. Not all software is safety critical, and my colleague Murphy will explain more as we uh, continue the conversation. But it's important to note that for aircraft systems, as well as some of the others we just mentioned, the probability of failure must be extremely improbable. We cannot afford to have even the slightest chance of a failure. And so our software systems and the system architecture of these critical systems have to be designed in a way that they're reliable and uh, there is uh, backup coverage so that we don't see critical failures happening. Here Mo, we developed a team that uses state-of-the-art tools, and in fact, we've advanced the state-of-the-art using names that may be familiar to you, Python, MATLAB, Simulink, eSpace. We've taken these tools and taken them to another level to provide more robust and, in many cases, more efficient ways of designing and certifying aircraft uh, flight critical safety systems. I'd like to introduce Nagaraj Murthy, who you were introduced to earlier. He has over 40 years of experience in aerospace systems, and I've come to uh, appreciate him as a colleague and a friend. And we'd like to have him now share with us um, some of the things he has learned over this, um, his great career. And here at MITC, as we develop new tools and new processes for uh, critical, uh, safety critical systems. Murky, we've mentioned a number of safety critical systems that affect all of us. Today we're focusing on aircraft systems, something that you know very well. At a top level, would you describe the key considerations in developing an aircraft system, especially a safety critical system? Thanks, Dick. So in the aircraft systems, you know, there's a very well defined process which is used to develop systems and subsystems. So over a period of years, there have been a number of agencies that have developed standards, technical guidance material, and processes in collaboration with certification agencies like FAA, EASA, and in other agencies, for, and also along with the industries, aerospace industries like MOVE, Honeywell and other companies who have developed the standards like there are many companies such as organizations like uh, uh, Society of Automotive Engineers and RPCA which is the Radio Commission, Technical Commission for Aeronautics and you know Adding which is the Aeronautical Radio Incorporated which have developed these type of standards. The objectives are you know to ensure the safe and safety and reliability of the airborne system developing minimum per operational performance requirements for different types of systems and developing guidelines for use by the regulatory authorities. So what we will do in the next few slides is that we will go through the system development process as defined by the certification agencies or the agencies that I have mentioned till now. So now if you look at it, the system development process is defined by the Society of Automotive Engineers and they have what is called a ERP document, that is the aerospace recommended practices. So, you know, we follow those uh, instructions very strictly and religiously. So, if you look at it, the first document that we follow is the aerospace recommended practices 4761, which starts with the safety assessment process. That is, every airline uh, aircraft uh, original equipment manufacturer has to follow this particular guideline and so we start with this particular thing which tells you know what are the safety requirements and what are the methods that you have to follow to uh, achieve those safety requirements. And then we have a system development process of the aircraft and the system because the aircraft has to follow and also the various systems that we develop also have to follow the standards and that is guided by or defined by aerospace recommended practices 4754. So if you go through these documents, it will give you a complete guideline on how to develop a, develop a system. It can be a safety critical or non 
safety critical system, but all of us have to follow that particular standard. Then, you know, coming to this particular thing about the system, we have both the hardware and the software. So, if we are developing in hardware, RTC has come up with a standard called DO254. And if you are developing a software, RTC has come up with a standard called DO178B. And now it has been updated to DO178C. In the same way, the Europeans also, they have their own standards. That is the EASA, so they call it the European uh, Document 80 and the ED-128. And of course, in the recent time, there has been what is called as an integrated modular avionics. From a federated architecture, we have now moved over to an integrated modular avionics. So the RTC has come up with a document called DO-297 for the development of the integrated modular avionics. So if you go to the next uh, slide, you will see the different safety levels that are defined by the FAA or even the uh, safety authority. That is, we have five levels of criticality, either it can be for hardware or software or system. Uh, so it, uh, there are five different safety levels which have been defined by the authority. That is, when we start with the topmost, that is the catastrophic event. Means, you know, if there is any failure which can result in a crash of the aircraft, you know, that is considered as the most harmful of the catastrophic event and that is defined as level A. And the failure rate in such cases, you know, can be, should be less than 1 in 10 to the power of minus 9. So then we come to what is next as the hazardous one, where there is a failure has a negative impact on the safety or performance of the aircraft but there is no passenger injury. But still, you know, there is a heavy pilot workload which is not acceptable or which is not desirable. Then we come to what is known as the major one, where, you know, it is called the level C, where the failure rate can be, should be less than 1 in 10 to the power of minus 9. Failure is significant, but has a lesser impact than hazardous failure to passenger discomfort. But again, here the, the pilot workload will be slightly on the higher side. And then we have minor, you know, which has very uh, less impact, and then we have no effect where there is no impact. I can give the examples of light control system or a stall warning system, which can be catastrophic. The failure of any of these type of systems can really endanger the aircraft and the life of the passengers. But if you take a flight data recorder or uh, some similar system, recording system, we categorize it as minor because it is not going to affect or impact the lives of the passengers or increase the workload on the pilot, but it may only lead to a loss of data of a few hours of flight, which can, which may not be so catastrophic, uh, which is not at all catastrophic, but there are very other different methods of getting the flight data. So if you come to the next uh, slide, we will look at the standard, what as, as I said, what is called as the ARP 47600, the first document. So whenever we design a system or an aircraft, what we do is we do a functional hazard assessment of the aircraft or the system. So what we do is we identify all the possible types of hazard that can happen. For example, you know, we'll say what happens if there's a loss of communication system. So what is the pilot going to do when there is a loss of communication system. So, and what are the risks involved in the failure of this? So we identify all that and then come to and classify the level of those particular failures. Like, you know, it can be level A or level B or, because the reason is we have to know the type of, uh, the level of the failure so that we can develop the system which can meet the safety requirements. Then we do a preliminary safety assessment, then we do a system safety assessment and then we do fault C analysis, failure mode effect analysis, and common mode analysis, you know, to name a few of the type of failure. I may not be able to go into the complete details due to lack of time, but, you know, it just tells you that there is a process and we have to follow this process to develop a system or an aircraft. So if you go to the next slide, that will tell you the complete process in a nutshell. That is, we start with a concept and architecture development, 
and then you know we do the aircraft functional hazard analysis. We take each there are various ATA numbers, the Air Transport Association standard numbers. So we go through each of these equipment and do a safety assessment and see what is the criticality level of the failure of each and every one of these systems. Then based on this we do a aircraft quality analysis that is what happens if this fails, if this system fails or if the, uh, if the other subsystems fail and then we make sure that you know the uh, aircraft is, can meet the safety requirements as uh, in the, uh, in the in, uh, defined in the concept space. Then we do a system functional hazard analysis. Like now, as I said, when we do the aircraft level analysis, we talk at the system level, but then we have to come down to the next system level. That is, now if I am developing a flight control system, I will do a functional hazard analysis of each of those systems. Like I have a processor card. So what happens if this card fails? And what happens if you know the input power supply to the hardware fails? So we go deeper and deeper to the failure conditions and then we do an assessment of which failures are more critical and where you require more redundancy. Then you know we do a detailed fault tree analysis. The fault tree analysis is done so that we can arrive at a particular failure level. That is you know how, what is the failure rate because if I know the hardware failure rate like for example I have a transistor or I have a processor or I have a capacitor or a resistor, we have standard failure rate which have been acquired over the past several decades. So we use those rates and then compute the probability of failure of that particular hardware. Because we have to finally show to the certification authorities that my failure rate meets the safety requirements specified in my functional hazard analysis. So that is the way then, then once we finish all this, we then go into the detailed design of the system. So once we have a system design, we have all the RTCA documents which specify the minimum operational performance requirements for each of these systems, whether it is a navigation system or a communication system or a flight control system, there are minimum performance requirements which I have to meet. So that forms the basis of my system design. And then from there, you know, once we have a system requirement document and a system design, then we go into the hardware document, hardware design and the software design. So this is the entire process of how we develop an aircraft and then the aircraft system. So the next one what we are seeing now shows how do we find out the reliability of a system. As I said, you know, we identify all the probable components and we go through the circuit diagram and see the dependencies and make a fault tree. So this helps us to find out whether I need to put like you know redundancy into this, whether I can do a single power supply or whether I need a dual power supply. So what happens if one of the power supply fails, how can I still my system continue to perform as it is performing? So this poultry analysis will tell us that how much design improvements have to be done and how we can meet the overall top level uh, requirement that is the level safety requirement that is the figure that is required to meet the safety requirements of either 1 in 10 to the power of minus 5 or 7 or 9. So this helps us to do the uh, fault tree analysis and the reliability analysis to permit the, um, our uh, certification agency. So this tells you a top level view of how we go about designing a system. So the next question. Great. Thanks, Martin. You've talked about the impact of system architecture and software on reliability. I'd like to explore this a little further. We know that there is a limit to the reliability that we can currently achieve in a complex physical system, the typical that you'd find in an automobile or an aircraft. The failure rates of these systems seem to be limited to a minimum failure rate of 1 times 10 to the minus 4, uh, but that's not good enough where lives are at stake. So I'd like to ask, how do we achieve the required safety levels in these safety critical systems? Yeah, okay. so this is a good question. So there are two things in this. One is, you know, how do you achieve the hardware safety levels and how do you achieve the software safety levels? As I said earlier, you know, we have classified the different levels at uh, level A, B, e, and C, uh, D. So what happens is in the case of software, there is very little we can do to estimate the failure rate like we did for the hardware because 
we cannot put a number for the software. So we have to follow what is called as the DO one seven eight B software level, that is the level A, level B, level C, which later on my colleague Yoga and Kavika will explain in detail. As far as the hardware is concerned, we found that you know we have been able to identify what is the failure rate. And when it it so happens that you know if we are not able to meet those requirements, we will go for redundancy or we will develop a system architecture which can meet those uh, safety and reliability requirements. So what we generally do is there are several types of system architecture where you have a dual lane architecture or a triple lane architecture and then when you have a dual lane or a triple lane and then you know even that cannot meet the requirement. So what you go and do is to go and put either two channels or what we call as two systems or three systems or quad systems. That is an aircraft can have something like three communication systems because if one of your system fails, the other two are there as a backup. In the same way for the flight controls also, what you are now looking at on your screen, on your screen is that is a typical flight control computer where there are dual lanes. That is, I have got two channels uh, which are uh, designed with two pro with a processor. For example, I can have a triple five four processor and I can have two lanes. That is, each of them will be performing the same function but at the end of a cycle, it will check whether the results at both the sides are the same. Means they keep comparing themselves and they make sure that both are agreeing. And if they do not agree, then they uh, annunciate a failure and their backup system which is there will automatically take over. So this is how you can improve the reliability and safety and the availability of the uh, system so that you know the pilot is not left high and dry, especially in a flight control system. It is very difficult to maneuver the aircraft for long distances, especially like for transoceanic flight. So we always go with a number of redundancy. So then, you know, we also have a typical example which um, I have shown, you know, as why that is required. So aircraft industry has developed redundant systems to address the limited reliability of individual physical systems. So this is how, you know, by having dual lane architecture or triple lane architecture or quad redundant system, so like in the LCA we have a quad redundant system where we have four flight control computers working. So there are different types, uh, levels of uh, redundancy that is built into it and each aircraft manufacturer has his own philosophy based on his experience and, you know, it is, we cannot say that this particular architecture will meet this requirement. It depends on each of the um, the requirement and the uh, like for example whether it is a short haul flight or a long haul flight because we cannot put the same conditions across all the aircraft. So because then it becomes so expensive that nobody can fly on it. So next I will show an example of a system architecture which we have developed for a um, Boeing aircraft where we call as the lateral control electronics. So these are typically three lanes that is we call a three circuit card, that is three circuit card modules. We call a CCM one, two, and three. So there are three cards which are parallelly computing the same um, algorithm, and there is a cross-channel data link through which they exchange the information at the end of every cycle, and then they vote out the bad one. And if everything is functioning fine, there is no problem. But even if one of the channels fails, the other two can continue to work. And if one of the other channels also fails, then the other system which is there, that is we have two flight control systems, the other one will automatically take over and ensure that, you know, there is no problem with the safety of the aircraft. So this in brief, you know, is very um, explains how a system is developed and how we define the system architecture and how we go about it. So probably in the next few um, presentations, you will see about the software, uh, more about the software aspect of our uh, development. Thank you, Murthy. I'd like to introduce Joganath Najepu, my colleague, who has also been in this industry for uh, more than two decades uh, with experience on some very uh, high-profile um, programs. And uh, Yoga's uh, experience has been uh, has taken him to places where we've continually pushed new technology and new frontiers. And so um, we're going to focus a little bit on some of the um, of those uh, achievements and what he sees uh, in the in the near future here. Yoga yeah. Murthy has discussed the architectures for safety critical systems, uh, how we design robust systems. 
As we think through the safety issues of any system, one concern is always how do we know that the system on any aircraft was built exactly as it was intended. Uh, I said it's the quality of the system. And we can inspect physical parts to be sure they function properly. But with software, it's not that easy, is it? There's nothing to physically measure. So it comes down to process, doesn't it? What processes are followed in design of these complex aircraft control systems? Thanks, Dave. I think uh, what you said that the different components can be inspected perhaps in a mechanical system, but in software, how do you go about it? So we have to follow a process. There is no other way around it. And we follow the process starting with the design to coding to testing and certification. So on the design phase, I'm going to highlight uh, briefly what we do. Uh, and uh, this is about an autopilot that was designed recently, and I'm just going to walk through the process very briefly. We start with something known as a flight envelope. This is the space in uh, altitude and velocity where my aircraft can function. Now, having decided on that, I did do something known as linear models. These are mathematical models of the aircraft that are generated over the flight envelope for different situations. So. I don't want to go very deep into this, but uh, you know, for the LCA program, we had about uh, two lakh models. So we generate so many models, and we design the control law for each and every uh, specific model. And uh, everything is driven by requirements. So the top level thing is a requirement. So we start with the system requirement, which is a flow down from the system architecture. And uh, it talks about what should be my software requirement what should be my software design going downstream. So before we go into the software design, we do the linear control system design. So we do uh, using tools uh, like MATLAB, uh, SCADE, and things like that. Uh, we have tools that are available. Using these, we do the linear control system design, what you normally study in your fourth semester of uh, controls, uh, uh, control theory, basically. And once we have a linear uh, control system in place, we do a lot of nonlinear shaping. And uh, we g generate the gain table for the entire flight angle. Now, this is the design process that has to be followed. And once everything is done, we verify that using extensive simulations. So we at MOVE, we run simulations overnight, over the weekend, come back the next day, check out our results, and ensure that my design is perfect. If there is any issue with my design, I go back all the way up to requirements if, in case my requirements are wrong, or else to my design phase, or else to my nonlinear shaping. Once the whole cycle is iteratively repeated, I come up with a design which is perfect, which is safe for me, and now I can give it to the coding team to code. So before I do that, I do a design document. So that document contains all these model pictures the functionality definition, and that is given to the control coding team, which does all the coding. Once the coding is done, we do a lot of model testing. So we have already done design using models. So how does the code compare against these models? So we do a lot of tests, uh, which are model-based tests, where I compare my model executed on the uh, maybe a PC and the actual code executed on my hardware. That is where I deploy it. So uh, Murthy was mentioning the CCM A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. So these are basically the cards. And we do the C code on each of the cards and ensure that all the C cards work the same way I have designed and as per my models. So this basically comes under the domain of model-based testing. So in the model based testing, we do have uh, you know Simulink models, or uh, it could be SCADE models. And uh, in Simulink, we have something known as a MEX. So MEX basically takes a C code and converts it to a model. So I can plug this C code directly into my model and run both of them together. And uh, the behavior I compare one on one, I go as low as 10 power minus 4 for a comparison. It's very small value in engineering terms. 10 power minus 4 is very, very small. And if it matches, I am saying that my model and code are good, and I go ahead with the next step. Uh, for the 747 program, we had uh, something known as 
expected reserves population tool, the ERP. Now this tool basically generated the expected results uh, from my model. So model had about uh, 50,000 odd blocks and this was executed using random tests, sin sinusoid waveforms, you know, doublets and all sorts of inputs and uh, this tool basically generates the expected output with which I compare. So for the Boeing 747, we ran 12 million tests on the all the three cards. The 12 million tests is quite a lot. It comes to about 60 or 70 hours of continuous flight time. Uh, no aircraft is going to fly continuously for 60 hours. Maximum from uh, here to you, uh, you go to uh, US, it would be 24 hours. So we run it continuously for 60 hours and ensure that everything passes. And this particular tool ran 24-7 and churned out the expected results and this is how we qualified the 747 program. Joker, you mentioned models and the large number of blocks that were tested for 747. I'd like to ask you though, what happens if there's a change in the system design on an aircraft program? How do you manage change with so many blocks involved? <laughs> yes, Dave. I mean, uh, we have 50,000 blocks and the customer says that I'm going to change one block. Uh, is that okay with you? And then we say that, okay, you change the block, but if you see in the figure, the arrow shows a single block that was changed and then see the impact of the single block change. You see all the blocks in orange. The orange color shows what are the different blocks that get affected because I change a single block. So we have a change impact analysis tool developed here, which tells the customer that, okay, you can go ahead and do the change, but you be prepared to pay us so many million dollars so that we can test it. Because each block that changes drives a change downstream, and then this tool tells you, okay, you will have to run maybe 200 tests. So if you repeat these 200 tests, then uh, you will be certifying this. You can certify this particular change. So it is quite a costly to make changes very late in the program, but we have change tools called change impact analysis tool, which can give you an accurate estimate of the kind of work that is required to be done. Great, thank you, Yoga. These tools have been very impressive. I can vouch personally that they've been very effective in helping us to move quickly on these aircraft uh, development programs and without a significant uh, cost increase to the customer. I'd like to now turn to my colleague Kavita. Uh, she is uh, also more than two decades of experience in this uh, exciting industry and her experience has resulted here in uh, the development of some very strong uh, processes um, and also teams who are following the processes with very rigor. And the results have been phenomenal on several aircraft programs, and I could need to, to be congratulated for that. Uh, her expertise, though, also uh, uh, spans several uh, military and missile programs, and that's given her a perspective on the process of coding and testing that uh, is uh, quite impressive. And I would like to ask you to uh, field a couple of questions, if you would, Kavita. Sure. Uh, I think there may be some young programmers <laughs> online who'd like to know how coding, how does it fit into this design activity that we've been discussing? Uh, is there anything different in coding for a safety-critical aircraft system than there might be for telecom or some other application? Yes, Dave. Coding in a safety-critical system is different from any other application. The goal of a safety critical system is to develop a safe, secure, and a reliable system. For example, we have to eliminate all the um, uh, behaviors that can lead to a hazardous situation. In order to achieve that, we have to have a strict discipline in coding by adopting to a set of predefined coding standards. So what is coding standards all about? The coding standards are a very critical attribute of the software development. It all states the ground rule for the software development and also specifies the language features that should and should not be used. Here I have given some sample coding rules that have that can be adopted that have been adapted in the several programs. 
So one such will be dynamic memory allocation. The dynamic memory allocation should never be used in a program because it tends to be non-deterministic. Means time taken for allocation is not predictable. And also it may lead to memory fragmentation and memory leak, which may lead to system failure. And the next one is very important, which is considered divide by zero protection. Any division operation in a system has to be protected for division by zero. The denominator in a division operation should never be a zero and it should be always be a non-zero element. If it is a zero, it can result in an undefined behavior in the system and which may lead to a system failure. And the one more will be equality operators should never be used in a floating point comparison because floating point, uh, floating point values can be a bit off than the actual value that is expected, so it can never report equality, so which may result in a system failure. So following a consistent coding standard helps improve the quality of the overall software system. In MOVE, we have come up with the um, coding, standard general, coding standard review tool, which is an automated tool, and it's a GUI based and a user-friendly tool. The software which is developed is reviewed against every rule in the standard and any non-conformance will be reported in an Excel sheet as a report for the later analysis by the reviewer. So this tool saves a quite a lot of human effort and avoids human error. So conformance to the coding rules defined are necessary to ensure the safety, reliability and security of the software systems developed. Hope I answered your question, Dave. That's very helpful. I'd like to uh, pursue this a little further. We mentioned earlier that uh, for mechanical and electrical systems, components are physically inspected to ensure reliability. Uh, but software does present a unique challenge. The complex aircraft systems we're discussing can have as many as 60,000 source lines of code, often more than that. How do you ensure that your code components are good? To ensure that the code component is good and correct, the structural coverage analysis is performed. This is an analysis which checks that every statement present in the software is relevant and is traceable to the requirement. And there are no dead code or an unwanted code which is present in the system which may lead to an unexpected behavior of the system. So 100% structural coverage is mandatory for a critical system. Here I have an example which has a decision and a condition and conditions in it. If you see if A and B is a decision and A and B are considered conditions. In this, every condition in a decision in the program has to take all possible outcomes at least once and every um, input to the condition should have an independent impact on the output of the decision. This is what is called as modified condition decision coverage testing which is very essential and critical for a testing safety critical system. So what it means is all possible conditions which contribute to the decision should be thoroughly tested. So in a safety critical system, 100% code coverage is mandatory. Now, it has been confirmed that the source code is good, but the actual that, that gets executed on the system are the object code. So it is a must to verify that the object code is correct. This is done by the object code verification. But what is this? This is to verify that the correspondence between the source to object code and also to ensure that the translation of the source code to the object code is fine. And there are no additions or deletions to the object code. Because in the compiler, when an optimization is set, it tends to delete or add few, um, few more object codes which may result in a hazardous situation, which may have a system failure. So we have to ensure that the source code or the object code has been translated properly and the object code doesn't have any unwanted or has not removed anything which is necessary for the system to perform its intended function. And also the compiler validation verifies that the compiler can handle the language syntax and the semantics which is written in the software. So these are taken care of as a part of compiler validation and object code verification. Beyond this, and in order to eliminate human error, we have peer reviews performed at each stage of software development life cycle for an unbiased evaluation of a product. So based on the safety level of the software, independence is mandatory. But what does it mean? What does independence mean? Artifacts are to be reviewed by a person other than the author of it, and artifacts are reviewed with independence, including the requirement code and also all the DNB artifacts. Finally, all the independently reviewed articles or the artifacts will be checked by an independent QA engineer to ensure that the quality process 
the week followed. So in summary, I would say by ensuring 100% structural coverage, object code verification and independence in every stage of software development life cycle, we can ensure that the code generated is good and it performs the functionality it is intended to perform. Thank you, Kavita. Very helpful. I'd like to ask Murthy if, if you would bring us back to the overall picture here because uh, we've, we've talked about tools that have been developed that are state of the art. That's wonderful. We've talked about dedication to following rigorous process and that's, that's paramount to our success. We've talked about independent evaluation so that there are no unanticipated uh, uh, sneak faults or leaks. But ultimately, I have to ask the question, knowing the answer, why don't we just automate the entire process? Why do we need people for this? And I, I think we know the answer, but Murthy, I'd like to have you just add a little bit of uh, to yeah. that. So, you know, the main aim of automation is, you know, two things. One is to improve the cost, means, you know, reduce the cost and improve the quality. That is, you know, if we have more people, because I think around uh, four to five years ago when we were doing the software development testing, we used to have 300 people, you know, working on a flight control system. And even then, you know, it used to take a long time. And in fact, when we started with the 747, we found that, you know, to review the artifacts, we had to put around 15 people for a year to do that. But, you know, with the development of what is called as an auto-review tool, that was developed by Yoga and his team, the whole, autumn, the whole uh, review process could be done within, a two, within two days or if you leave it on the weekends, you know, you come on Monday and you could see the artifacts. The advantage was that it produced the same results any number of times you run it. And this was appreciated by even companies like Boeing, you know, because they found that there was very little probability of errors that could occur. Because if our review tool is developed correctly, then your output also will be more accurate and more reliable. So that is the advantage of having more and more tools. Like Kavita said about the coding standard tool. Earlier we used to put people and ask them to go through the whole code and see, you know, what are the ones which are violating our coding standards. Now we don't have to do that anymore. We simply run this particular tool and you get an Excel sheet which will say whether it is uh, passing or failing. So these are the advantages, you know, that uh, we get by developing a tool. But who develops the tool? Again, the human beings have to develop the tool and they have to put intelligence into that so that it provides the right results. And again, you know, when we write a test case or a test procedure, many of the textual requirements cannot be automated because it is based on the text. If it is a model, I can try to automate even the test case generation. But when it's a textual requirement, automatically the human being has to be in the loop. So what we are trying to do is to have a balance between the software engineers and the tools which can provide the best results. Thank you, Murthy. And I just would applaud you and your team for the, the excellent results of the project management and that the higher level thinking that has gone into these recent programs. Congratulations on that. We are uh, now heading towards uh, a session of uh, questions from our uh, listeners. I just wanted to, uh, maybe we'll go back one slide, just bring a couple of thoughts together. Uh, one is uh, we've been able to find a significant savings in the time and an improvement in quality by automating some of this process. But as Murthy has emphasized, the human element and understanding the higher level, more subtle features of a safety critical system are still paramount and not replaceable by automation. Uh, and ultimately, it depends upon a dedication to quality by each individual in the process. Uh, we would now like to uh, open up to some questions, um, and we will, uh, as uh, the subject uh, leads, uh, one of us will respond to your questions. So. Uh, back to our moderator. So, all right. so our, 
We have a question here on why dead code has to be removed. So, Kavita will be answering this. Um, why dead code has to be removed? Yeah, that anything undetermined or unpredictable should not be present in a safety critical system. System should be a deterministic system. So if there is a dead code present, we don't know what is what is its intended functionality and when it gets activated, what will be the you know, impact on the system behavior. That is the reason the dead code should not be present. We have one more question here. Uh, need more information on why equal operator should not be used for floating point comparisons. Yeah, floating points, uh, no, if you say it is 0 0.1, you never know whether it will be exactly 0 0.1. In some compilers it may be 0 0.0999, in some it may be 0 0.111. So you can never say these floating point values will be equal. And you may have an undetermined or undefined uh, outcome of the comparison. So you should always have an epsilon defined for that. So you should say A minus B is greater than the epsilon value. What should be the minimum value of the difference you should have? So based on that you should design your logic. Any other questions? What is masking MCDC, which is in news since DO178C got released? Uh, it's basically um, MCDC, uh, which was there earlier. Uh, only thing is that uh, what we are saying is that if you can prove that uh, the input has an effect on the final output, that is uh, sufficient. Uh, any change in input uh, has to be shown to be affecting the final output. So it is something very similar to what was there earlier. There is uh, no big difference. Uh, is what I can see from there. I, I, in case of masking, one thing I can say is suppose it is an AND gate, I may have four test cases. Now, uh, if I have a complex logic, uh, if I can demonstrate that one input is getting, uh, you know, affecting the final output, it's more than sufficient. Yoga, if I could, I'd, I'd like to ask you a question. As we were talking about the uh, the reviewing tool, uh, you know, how do we how do we know we've captured all of the the uh, possible cases? What were we, what were the challenges you faced in understanding what inputs you had to use to validate that that tool? Uh, right, Dave. I think. Uh, uh, it, basically came from the experience in uh, testing uh, flight control systems and uh, we knew how to test individual blocks. So, uh, no, but we have 50,000 blocks. So, I have to test each and every block and the uh, input that is injected is from the uh, sensor end. I mean, it is uh, at the extreme end where the pilot gives the input or the sensor is injecting into my system and the output is an actuator. So like uh, uh, we have to show in MCDC an independent effect, I have to show an effect of all the inputs on the final actuator output. So what we had to do was we have to generate uh, test signals uh, at the end to end level, that is the input end level, and then we have to go into the block, tap out all the internals, and go through our uh, uh, the auto review tool which was instrumenting and the individual blocks, and it had a mathematical notation. It knows how to test the saturation blocks. So if it is a saturation block, I have to test that the input is hitting the upper limit, input is hitting the lower limit. So I have to generate sine waves, I have to generate uh, ramps, I have to generate doublets to ensure that this saturation block is hitting the upper and lower limits. Great, thank you. That was not something you just did in an afternoon, for sure. It, it was not done in an afternoon. So our next question, if you could read that, I want to talk about redundant systems. We'll ask uh, Murthy if he would answer that question. Uh, what is the powerful voting logic 
that is used in 747 uh, development. There are different uh, voting logics uh, which are used, you know, where we have some five uh, previous um, inputs and then we take a uh, voting of the five and see whether, you know, if there are any changes and then we do it. And if they are going beyond a specified threshold, for example, now I have got an altitude of, uh, say, you know, 10 feet. If my air data computer are giving me which are uh, difference is more than 10 feet between each of these air data systems, then, you know, I vote out the one which is not good. So it depends on from program to program, and each program will have, means, you know, each uh, supplier will follow a particular way of doing it. So it is not that, you know, each it can be decided by each of the team, design teams that they are doing based on the requirement. Like, you know, if my airspeed has to be within this one, then I put some limit on my system that, you know, if there are differences between the air data systems beyond that. Because when an aircraft is flying especially, you can have uh, different uh, roll angles or pitch angles and your air data computers may not give the same value. So when you do a redundancy voting logic, you have to know very clearly that what is the maximum difference that can occur at different flight conditions to do a voting. Thank you, Marty. That's something that the passenger in the aircraft doesn't think about. <laughs> the passenger will never know what is happening, but you know it's all in the design and what are the minimum performance requirements, what I said, it all depends on that one. We have one more question. If all redundant systems are identical in nature, there is a chance that all can fail together. Yeah, this is a good question. In fact, you know, when we have been designing the system, I could not explain you because it is a big one. So what happens is with many of the vendors, what we do is they go for dissimilar software. Like, for example, I have got a design team. I have three, I have three design teams for three different processors so that I do not have the same common failure. So typically take in 747. What we have done is we have got three different processors like 554, 673, 6713 from Texas Instrument and PowerPC 440EP. So, you know, there is a very a little chance of that having the same common mode failure. I cannot, if I use the same processor, then I can have a same prop, uh, failure at the same time. But when I go for a dissimilar processor, then I do not have that problem. And again, when I come to the compiler, what we do is we cannot use the same compiler like for example Green Hills. I cannot use the same compiler for all the three processors. So what we do is we go for a Green Hills compiler, then we go for a Code Warrior, and then you know the other Texas Instrument compiler. So we have dissimilar compilers, dissimilar processors, and nowadays you know some of the um, equipment uh, manufacturers they are asking us that we should have dissimilar design teams. But if you look at all these, what happens if I have more and more design teams? then I'll be increasing the cost of my product. So we have to take a balanced view on this, but you know, we always go by what the certification agency says or what the equipment manufacturer wants. So there are a host of things, you know, to provide the similarity. Thank you, Martin. That's great. We have a question for Kavita. Uh, if I want to compare variable A to point A, what is your suggestion on how to implement this? This is what which I have already told that if you want to compare two floating points, you should have A minus B compared with an epsilon. So you should decide what should be your that delta or epsilon value. It can be a very close if you want to go, you can have to the fourth decimal or to the sixth decimal. So you say A minus 0 0.8 is less than uh, 0 0.00, whatever may be the precision one, and you have your logic. So if you want that outcome to be true, what should be your uh, statement? What should be the execution that it should happen? So that is what is the recommended practice. Kavita, you can take uh, one more question. Uh, how is this kind of development different from the conventional software development? Yeah, conventional software development, uh, no, the first and foremost will be the coding standards which we follow here. So we have strict guidelines uh, that uh, the naming conventions of the variable, how it should be. We should have appropriate comments. What should be the nesting level of your uh, uh, no, uh, if and else statements and the function calls nesting there and condition decisions in your uh, um, uh, decision statements, how many conditions or decisions are allowed and you can gather, you can have a uh, no, redundant uh, go-to statement and uh, 
that, this is, there are so many aspects which have to be taken care of when you develop a safety critical system. But in the conventional, you may have variables in the step one and two. Where there also it is not recommended. But the nobody, you know, points out to say that it should not be used. So we follow a strict coding guidelines here, and it is more in a modular way. So an impact in one module should not have a greater impact on the other module. And um, we have a uh, uh, concept called as uh, you know, the parameter hiding, where we should not one module should not affect the parameters which are being executed by the other modules. So these are the things which we take care in uh, safety critical systems development. Uh, I have a question for Murthy here. Uh, redundancy as a design strategy has long been an instrument to deal with failures in a sense that there is another fear. Uh, has there been any other alternatives added to this strategy to give us a choice? Uh, there have been no uh, other you know, options available because uh, there is a lot of uh, research going on in this area, but uh, I do not think to the best of my knowledge, you know, we can avoid any redundancy because we will have to have, if we want to meet the safety requirements, like I said, you know, of 1 in 10 to the power of minus 9, then, you know, with the available existing uh, hardware components, which have slightly low failure rates depending on what type of component it is, we will never meet the safety requirements. So redundancy, I don't think, you know, we can get away from it. Thank you, but of course, you know, we have different types of redundancy. If you take the actuation system, we have hydraulic actuators, electromechanical actuators, and uh, different types of actuation systems. So there we provide, again, you know, because if we have a similar type of actuation system, there can be common mode failure. So we have, even in that one, we have different types of uh, redundancy, but it can be different techniques of manufacturing that one, or different principles of operation. Thank you, Martin. There's a question for Kavita. Yeah, there's a question for Kavita. Uh, this is, do you think new age technologies like Java slash .NET will make it to mission critical software in future? Very good question. Yeah. Good question. yeah. Um, there is no hard and fast rule that the, the which language has to be used for the mission critical software in development. But more commonly used is the C language. There is a military program. We even have ADA language. But the preference to have a C language is because we have, you know, it is proven and we have many people uh, knowledgeable in that uh, field of C language. But I'm not very sure how Java and .NET will be helpful in that because it should not have. The thing is, you, know, you cannot have any object oriented programming because testing is virtually impossible. Now if you take C++, you know, you cannot use all the features of C++, only a few, select few. FAA so far was not even allowing some of those uh, C++, but when it comes to DO178C, they have come up with standards even for the object-oriented programming. But uh, the other one is, you know, these are all very time critical. In addition to being safety critical, what happens is if I am, uh, have to execute some control system, say, within 5 milliseconds, my code has to be very optimum. If I use a Java or a .NET, it can increase the time that is taken to implement the algorithm. So that's why you know, we try to do it and see, and in some cases, even we go down to the assembly level. Though we have got very high speed processors and uh, better compilers, but still, you know, what we are finding is even to meet some of those requirements of timing, we have to still stick to C programming language. And to add to this point, even if we use ADA, ADA is an object-oriented language. We don't use the full features of object-oriented concepts in ADA. We just go by object-based concepts of ADA and we don't utilize the full concepts. That is one more in that. Uh, adding to that, uh, I think there is a version of safety critical Java which uh, NASA is uh, exploring. So they are exploring uh, all these things, but it will be a safe subset. So somebody will have to ensure that the um, coding language is a safe subset. They have to ensure that the compiler compiling this language is generating the safe subset of uh, object code and that has to be validated. Okay, one more on the uh, on tools there. Good. Would you could take this up? There was, I was expecting more insight on uh, safety concerns, methods to de deploy on solving them uh, rather than the presentation of tools. Uh, okay. Well, the, that's the challenge of a topic like this is the, the interrelation between the hardware, the software, and then the architecture you choose. It ends up being 
so many, so many different possibilities. And what we've been presenting here is actually the result of several decades in this industry of selecting the combinations that are most effective to give us safety critical, uh, you know, the, the high performance on these safety critical systems. Uh, you're welcome to contact us. We'll give you contact uh, information at the end if you had a specific question. Um, but there are so many, so many uh, possible solutions, and the industry has done a great job of selecting now a smaller subset that are most effective for these duty cycles. Uh, we had one more question on asking about what is uh, level A in DO-178. I think, I think we spent a little bit of time about that. Maybe you could just give kind of a capsule. Version. Yeah, as I said in my initial uh, uh, introduction, there are different safety levels that have been uh, classified and given by the certification agencies. So level A is the highest one, which is called as the catastrophe. So either you can develop a system or you can develop a software or you can develop a hardware, all of them have to meet the level A criteria. But as I said earlier, it is very difficult to measure in, in the case of software as to how we are going to meet that requirement. So the level A process, what Kavita was talking about, involves lot of testing and like MCDC coverage, you know, which may not be done if it is a level C software. So depending on the safety crit criticality of the system, the software level is identified. So if it is a very, uh, 1 in 10 to the power of minus 9 and if it is catastrophic, then we go to level A software. And level A software, you know, involves a lot of uh, development and testing methodologies that have to be followed, which becomes quite complex. Thank you, Murphy. I think our time is just about up. Uh, what I'd like to do is just um, offer that um, we've covered a lot of ground here today. Uh, we've, you know, we've talked about developing both architecture and software for safety critical systems and the fact that it requires rigor in following a proven process. Uh, we talked about developing model-based uh, systems development tools and processes and how that can really streamline our process of development and eliminate some human errors potentially. And then Kavita talked about both encoding and the independent uh, validation and verification, how strict process and, in, and separation of the uh, design and the verification uh, processes gives us much better coverage and that significantly reduces the chance of a, of a failure. Um, we've enjoyed uh, sharing some of these with you and they were good questions. Thank you for the great question. We'd like to offer, if you'd like to connect with us, uh, feel free to contact us uh, at, at our website or the email careers at mob.com, .co.in. Uh, you could also follow me on LinkedIn or uh, on Twitter. We'd be glad to hear from you. Um, feel free to reach out, and uh, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, out there. And, 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 I'm, and I'm really thankful to our guest speakers today for conducting this wonderful webinar. It was indeed a great session. I would also like to thank all our participants for their support in making this webinar a success. The recording of the webinar will be available on techgig.com by tomorrow. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Thank Nagarajan. You. Thank you, Yogananda Jeppu. I hope you have a great evening ahead. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Kavita. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.